I wanted this morning, uh, we have prepared the Lord's table for all who and all believers. Uh, we have an open communion. We have some guests with, with us this morning, some visitors. And we welcome you with, to be with us this morning. You're welcome to partake of the Lord's table with us. Our only requirement is that you be born again and saved. That's it. That's not our requirement. That's his. But uh, anyway, I, uh, this Thursday, this last Thursday, was the beginning of the Jewish autumn feast days. Rosh Hashanah. Uh, or some call it the Feast of Trumpets. And I kind of like that because I'd like to <laughs> blow the show for <laughs> the trumpet like this. I, uh, when, 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 when we look at these things, you know, somebody will say, well, you know, th we're New Testament believers. We're uh, under grace and not under law. And the feast days can't save us, and the, the uh, sacrifices can't save us. And, uh, and that's, well, actually, the feast days and sacrifices, they couldn't save them either. Salvation comes one way. Salvation comes by faith. From Adam until now, and until Jesus returns. Forever, salvation is by faith. When the Apostle Paul wanted to give an example of what real salvation is, he used Abraham as an example. It's in the Old Testament. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, 5,000 people got saved. He didn't preach out of Romans, because it hadn't been written yet. He didn't give them the Romans road. He didn't preach out of, you know. He preached out of Joel and the Psalms. He preached out of the Old Testament. Salvation is by faith. It's not different in the Old Testament or the New. What's different is, we know more than they did. Because... God revealed himself in his fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So somebody might say, well, why, you know, you, you look at these old uh, festivals. We don't celebrate them. Uh, normally, some, some do. Uh, and you can't be saved by some. We don't have to celebrate them because Christ fulfilled all those things. I like Jewish things. I like Old Testament festivals and offerings and so forth because they all point to Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. And to learn the foundation of our faith and learn these things, I think, is very important. So uh, this morning, I was going to talk a little bit before we partake of the Lord's Table about the autumn feasts of our Lord. Now, let's see if it will work. Hey, there it goes. All right. We know that there are seven uh, feast days, seven holidays that were given in the Bible. Now, the Jews have some other holidays that, they've, that they celebrate, but there are seven biblical holidays. There are four holidays that come in the springtime, <clears throat> excuse me, and there are three that come in the autumn. The seven holidays I have up there, Passover, which is the 14th day of the, the Hebrew month of Nisan, which would be like our April, uh, and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts at the Passover and goes for seven days, and the Feast of First Fruits, the day after the Sabbath during the Unleavened Bread, always on a Sunday. The Feast of First Fruits is always on the first day of the week because it comes after the Sabbath during the, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the Feast of Weeks, or the Day of Pentecost, which is when the Holy Spirit descended. Those are the four spring holidays. The, uh, the three autumn holidays are the Feast of Trumpets, which was uh, Thursday, and that would be the first day of the Jewish month of Tishri. Uh, ten days later, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and then uh, five days after that, the Feast of Tabernacles, would be, which would be celebrated for a number of days. Now, each one of these holidays, uh, they have a historical significance, a spiritual significance, and a prophetic significance. They're all significant. They all mean something. They all uh, have, a, a, they mean more than what they just are. They were agricultural feasts, but they would celebrate the harvest and so forth. And they look back to certain things that happened in the history of Israel, like the escape from Egypt and the giving of the law and so forth. But our concern, my concern anyway, my main thing is the prophetic significance. Because each of these holidays have a prophetic significance. They were looking forward to something that is to come. Now the spring holidays, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost, these, the prophetic aspect of these holidays were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? The Passover, we know that Jesus Christ was called the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He was the Passover lamb. He was the Passover sacrifice. That's the death of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for us and, and, and made the atonement for our sins. 
Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread deals with his burial. Because if, if you read about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they would, they would hide leaven in the house, and they had to go through and find it. And we know, of course, leaven is a type of sin, and they had to get the leaven out. And it talked about, you know, the, the, the uh, burial of, of, the, of the fleshly body. The third holiday, first fruits, was the resurrection. It always, that's why first fruits always comes on a Sunday. Because Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. So God, when he commanded these feast days, he always made sure that when they celebrated first fruits, it didn't matter. Passover could be any day of the week. Uh, the, you know, the, the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread could, could start any day of the week. But the Feast of First Fruits was always on a Sunday because that's when Jesus was raised from the dead. Okay? And finally, the Feast of Pentecost, which was 50 days later, was when the Holy Spirit was given. And the church was filled, and they all spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And that was the beginning of what this thing is called the body of Christ, the church, that we're a part of right now. It's still going on. Still filled with the Holy Spirit, a still, uh, still is a spirit-empowered body of believers that God uses to be his witnesses on this earth, okay? So that's the first thing. That's, th those things have been fulfilled prophetically. But this morning we want to talk about the autumn feast. Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then Tabernacles. And, and specifically, we're going to focus on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, but these three... Uh, feast days, Rosh Hashanah is representative of what we are looking forward to as the rapture of the church. These things haven't happened yet. We are still waiting for the prophetic fulfillment of what God was showing us in these, in these feast days. We believe that Rosh Hashanah represents the rapture of the church, the catching away of the saints, calling up the body of Christ to be forever with the Lord Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of the righteous dead that we'll read about in a minute in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the very solemn day, that was a day when uh, they would, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, and uh, he would present the blood for the, for the sins of the, of the nation every year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And finally, the Feast of Tabernacles was a great celebration. Yom Kippur, I was, believe, is dealing with when Jesus Christ comes back to judge the earth uh, at the end of the seven-year tribulation period that we believe is going to happen. Uh, Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. There's going to be a great earthquake, and he's going to judge all the armies. The, the Jerusalem will be encompassed, encompassed with armies. Uh, we read that in the scriptures, and you could read that. That could happen any time. They're working on that. And uh, when that happens, Jesus will return and defeat the armies with the word of his mouth, and he will establish his millennial kingdom, which refers to the Feast of Tabernacles. But just a little bit about Rosh Hashanah and the Feast of Trumpets. Now, again, if you follow the, the, the way it's set up, 30 days before Rosh Hashanah, they begin a period, the Jews, especially Orthodox Jews, begin a period called Teshuvah. And Teshuvah means repentance. Let's imagine that. Hearing that word in the church, huh? Repent? Repentance? It, it deals with a time when they, when they start looking inwardly. They start to examine themselves, just like the Apostle Paul said, before you partake of the Lord's table, let a man examine himself. The time of teshuva is a time of examining yourself. And after the, after the, the blowing of the trumpet, Rosh Hashanah, there's a, there's a time, the ten days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are called the days of awe, A-W-E, the days of awe. And that's a time when they're really supposed to really intensely start to look inside themselves. And not to look inside themselves to see great potential of what they could be, you know, live a better life and all this stuff. But they need to look inside themselves to see how many ways they have forsaken their, their relationship with God. How many ways they've, they've turned their back and turned their head from, from what God has called them to be. It's a time of repentance because Yom Kippur is a time of atonement, a time of covering their sin. So this time that we're entering into, you know, before we can celebrate tabernacles, we have to do the day of atonement. Okay, now, I have to repent for using these devices. Okay. The Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Uh, uh, there are different names for that. It can be translated different ways. It's called the head of the year. Again, traditionally, a lot of the Jews believe that uh, it was on this date that the earth was created in Genesis. That's Jewish tradition. It's not necessarily biblical. Uh, it celebrates the creation of the world, 
and, and they celebrate it with the blowing of the shofar. Now again, <clears throat> I, I, uh, I, I like to blow the shofar, and I, we open our Sunday morning service with it, and there are other times when I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll blow this, and um, I guarantee you that the, the, when, when the trump of God sounds, it'll sound a whole lot better in, than my version. But <clears throat> it, it, uh, the blowing of the shofar has significance. And again, I've heard people say, and I've heard, I've heard folks say, well, you know, that blowing of the shofar, that's Old Testament, and that's, well, yeah, it is, and, and, you know, we don't have to blow the shofar, it's not something, but it's something, I think it's kind of nice, because uh, when we talk about blowing of the shofar, uh, it was blown a number of times when the Torah was given to Israel. When the law was given, they blew trumpets, because trumpets were a time when they would call people, they would, it was a heralding thing. Uh, at the Battle of Jericho, we know Joshua with the Battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Well, what they did on that seventh day, when God gave the command, they would blow the trumpets and they shouted and what happened? So it, it represents, you know, power from God. Uh, it was a call to war when, when there was a battle or there was a time when would, they would want to uh, get a, a mass all the men together to get ready to fight a battle. They would blow the trumpets. Uh, it was a warning. Ezekiel talks about the watchman on the wall and blowing a warning. You know, God wants to warn us sometimes. Matter of fact, most of what the prophets had to say were warnings to the people. Warning, you know, you better get right with God. Um, when John was taken up to heaven to see visions of the future and revelation, trumpets were blown at the coronation of kings. As a call to repentance, trumpets were blown. Okay. Trumpets were blown to announce the day of the Lord from Joel chapter 2. Uh, the, the trump will be blown at the rapture of believers at, and the resurrection of the dead. And will, it will be blown to announce God's judgment during the Great Tribulation. So the idea of trumpets is a very, uh, is a very uh, deeply rooted thing in, in the scriptures. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Leviticus. 23, or you can read it on the screen. Leviticus 23, and uh, starting at verse 23, I believe. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So in just a couple verses, we get the command in Leviticus about what they need to do on this particular day of blowing of trumpets. Now, it begins the day of all, as I said a little bit earlier. It begins a time of self-examination, and uh, repentance. Uh, there are other Jewish names for this day. Yom Hadin, the day of judgment. Hamalek, the coronation of the Messiah. Uh, Kiddushin Nesuin, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but the wedding ceremony. These are other names the Jews use for Rosh Hashanah. Yom Hakasa, the hidden day. All these things, they're all pointing to the rapture and the resurrection, the great tribulation, and the literal and physical return of Jesus Christ as our conquering king. Okay. Now. The gathering of the saints. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to look in the New Testament. And this is a passage that's very familiar to all. Why do we believe in a rapture of the saints? Why do we believe there's going to come a time. When God is going to call all the saints home to be with him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you don't have that address memorized. You ought to because it's a very important passage. 4 and 13. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he, uh, if, you, if you read this letter, he wrote this letter and uh, was answering a lot of questions uh, that they had. There was a lot of questions and a lot of concerns that the, that the saints at Thessalonica had. It's particularly, one of them was about saints that had died. They thought that maybe they were going to miss Jesus. Listen to what he has to say in verse, starting at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, which means dead, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, if we believe, do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? You do? I hope you do. If you don't, I hope you will before you leave. Well, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, then we believe that when, when he comes back, he's going to bring those people who have died, he's going to bring them with him. Now, how can he bring them with him if they're not, you know, if they're in the ground, right? Now, their spirits, we know they're absent from the body, present with the Lord. When we die, our spirit goes to be with Jesus. But our bodies are buried. How's he going to do that? Well, listen to what he has to say. He's saying, they're not, they're not missing Jesus. They're not missing the second coming of Christ. He said, listen. In verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not go before them, prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now here's when Christ returns. The Feast of Trumpets is looking forward to this event we're reading about right here. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. Could happen tomorrow. Might not happen for another thousand years. I don't know. Nobody knows when this is going to happen. Okay. When they try to tell you they know when it's going to happen, you can bet your money it's not going to happen then. Okay. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the what? The trump of God. There's going to be a lot of noise when Jesus comes back. It's going to be noise that I, I, I don't know if everybody's going to hear it. I know we're going to hear it. The whole world might hear it. and say, what in the world is that? When we hear it, you know what? We're going to know it because he says, my, my sheep know my voice. When we hear that trump sound, when we hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, when we hear that, we're going to look up and in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, in a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, we're going to be out of here. Now, now, I want you to understand something. It doesn't mean we're going to miss bad stuff. A lot of bad stuff has happened on this planet. And it could be a whole lot, a whole lot worse before he comes back. But we're not going to miss the, the bad stuff that people are doing, but we're going to miss the wrath of God. The trump is going to sound, and we're going to miss God's wrath. Now, he's angry, but he's not angry at me. He's not angry at you. You know why? Because you're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. He's not... Uh, he's not angry with you, not because you've been good or you've done something good. If you've earned his favor, if you've earned his grace, you haven't earned anything. I haven't either. But he's not mad at, us, be, mad at us because we're covered with the blood of Jesus. And when he sees us, he doesn't see our unrighteousness. He sees Christ's righteousness. That's what the Word says, that he's become our righteousness and our sanctification. So we're not going to suffer the wrath of, uh, you know, the wrath of God. He says this. By the word of the Lord, verse 15, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, here's the way it's going to happen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And you know who's going to hear it before we do? Pap's going to hear it. Pap's going to hear it. The, the, the loved ones, the, the, the ones that we know that were saved, that had died, they're, they're, they're spiritual with the Lord right now because they're absent from the body, present with the Lord. But their bodies are buried or burned up or wherever they might be. But I'll tell you something, when that trump sounds, the, body is going, the bodies are going to hear. They're going to hear the trumpet. They're going to hear the voice. And bodies everywhere are going to begin coming up out of the grave. I say, well, they were burned up in the fire. It doesn't matter. See, because I've said this before, everybody lives forever somewhere in a body. Everybody lives forever somewhere in your flesh. When Jesus was resurrected, he wasn't resurrected as a spirit floating around. He was resurrected in a body. Body, soul, and spirit. You're going to live forever somewhere in a body and you'll always be you. That's what Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of the trumpet, celebrates the rapture of the dead, the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the living saints. And where are we going to go? We're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And who is the bride? We are, the body of Christ. Jesus is the bridegroom and we are, uh, we are the bride. It says we'll be clothed in white raiment. And there will be this great marriage supper of the Lamb that you can read about in uh, Revelation chapter 19. Where all the saints of God are going to be gathered together, the bride of Christ. Once again, after the blowing of the trumpet. That's the picture of Rosh Hashanah, the, the, uh, the, the, the marriage supper, the marriage feast. You know, if you know the story of of how, you know, the ancient Jewish wedding uh, 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 customs were, you know, when a, when a man would uh, make an arrangement with a, a woman's father to have her as bride, he would go and prepare a place, and then when he would come back unannounced, 
And when he would come back to take his bride, they would be blowing trumpets. And he'd come back with an entourage and they would be having a big party celebrating, you know, the, 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 the groom going to get his bride. And so forth. Well, that's the way, that's just the picture of what's going to happen when Christ comes back for us. Like it's going to be a great celebration. Okay? Listen to what he says. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, if we're living at that time, if we're, we have not died, we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's our Rosh Hashanah. Now that's what we're looking forward to as believers. Could happen tomorrow. It might not happen for another thousand years. I might not live to see that time as, you know, being a, a person, a living person. But there's going to come a time where if I die, my body is going to come up out of the ground. And the same is true with you or anybody that knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's the celebration of the Feast of Trumpets. I want to show you something else. Well, let's, let's read, let's read this, the rest of this before we go on. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's okay to comfort one another and say, hey, someday we're going to be with Jesus. <laughs> Now, some people say, oh, that's just kind of pie in the sky. Listen, that's, that's the biggest comfort I can get. I can't find any comfort in this world. There's nothing in this world that makes me feel good about anything. Now, I, the more I look, the more I don't want to look. I quit watching the news. Well, I haven't, but I'd like to. <laughs> the news, reading the paper, I just glance through the paper. I don't even read it all anymore because it's so depressing if you, if you dwell on that kind of stuff. You know, it's so, not so much what we hear, but who we listen to. We need to believe God's report. Because what we see going on around us, it's not going to be like that forever. It's not going to be like that forever. God's going to make everything right. Turn with me to the other passage that is, goes just with this one. It's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection chapter. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it would be good. We could read the whole chapter, but we're not going to do that because we'll be here too long. Uh, look at verse 51. Paul was explaining the resurrection. If you want to know about, you know, resurrection, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to know about love, read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you want to know about resurrection, read chapter 15. This is what he says in verse 51. Behold, I show you what? A mystery. A mystery in the New Testament was something that has been revealed. Okay? It's, it's like the end of the story. Like if you read a mystery novel, you go all the way to the back to see who done it. Okay? The mystery, when, when Paul talks about a mystery, he's talking about something that has been revealed. Something that was hidden before, but now has been revealed. He says, I'll show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not everybody's going to die. Now, he wrote this 2,000 years ago. I'm sure that everybody that was alive then has, been, has died since then. Okay? And, and, and many, many people have died over the last 2,000 years. But there's going to come a time when the living won't die. The living believers won't die. Okay? He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52. How? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. If Paul were living today, he might have wrote in a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Okay? In the twinkling of an eye, at the last what? Trumpet. Shofar. Feast of trumpets. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Pap will raise in, in a body that's not 96 years old. Okay, Brother Bill will raise in a body that's not 84 years old and, and racked with all kinds of... And those loved ones that we know, Johnny and, and Alex, and we could go, I could go through here. I know so many people who have lost loved ones who have, who have gone on to be with the Lord. But their, their bodies are going to come up out of the grave, and they're going to be changed. Just like Jesus. When they put Jesus' body in the grave, it was all beat up. Bloody, scars, bloody, beat up, you know, thorns in the head and everything else. When he came out of that tomb, he was resurrected in a new body. When he comes back again, he's going to come back in glory. The only thing he's allowed to remain in his body with the holes in his hands and the side of his feet is an eternal reminder of, of what, he, what he did for us. But he says... In a moment, in the twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That means they won't get sick anymore. Thank the Lord. 
and we shall be changed. Why? For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. I can't enter into heaven in this thing. My spirit's been born again. I'm a new creature in Christ. My soul has been, has been surrendered, obedience to, well, trying to, <laughs> obedience to Christ. Okay? But this flesh, it can't enter in. Why? Because this, this flesh is rotting away. I hate to say it like that, but that's what's going on. And you all know what I'm talking about, especially if you've been around longer than 20 or 30 years. Some young people don't think you'll ever get old. But, but it's rotting away. This flesh hasn't been redeemed yet. I can't enter into the presence of God in this flesh. Something's got to happen. Something's got to be changed. I need a new body. This one's wearing out. It's wearing out pretty quick. I need a new body. He says, we shall all be changed. For this corruptible, this thing that's wearing away, got to put on something that will never wear away. And this mortal has to put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Thank God. I don't have, no more death. No more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. I don't have to be afraid of dying because Jesus Christ conquered death in the grave. Amen. Death, where's your sting? Death hurts. Come on, when you, lo you lose a loved one, even if they're saved, it hurts when you have to say goodbye. Grave, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory. We have the victory this morning. We have the victory over death. We have the victory over the grave. We have a victory over sin. We have victory over sickness. We have victory over everything Satan tries to put on us because we're washed and covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing that can take that from us. We blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet in Zion. We blow the trumpet. We sound the alarm. We say, listen, this is, this, is our, this is our hope. This is what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to the time when Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds and says, come up here. And we'll hear the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel. And we'll be forever changed and in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what Rosh Hashanah is about. And, and those Jews that believe in Jesus as their Messiah, they know it. They know it. And they still celebrate. They don't celebrate because they're required to by law. They're celebrating because they're celebrating Jesus. They're celebrating Christ. They're celebrating the promise. This is God's redemptive plan. He wants to raise us up. He wants to see us be new creatures in Christ. My question is today, are you ready? Are you ready for the rapture? Are you ready for the rapture? Are you ready? Are you ready? To see Jesus. That's a question. See, you know what I'm finding out? There's people that think that they're ready. But when you get talking to them, you wonder if they're really ready. You know. Because, again, we go back to this days of awe thing. Remember? We talked about between Rosh Hashanah and, the, and the Yom Kippur. The days of you've got to look at yourself. You know what I'm finding out? A lot of folks don't want to look at themselves. Well, they might want to look at themselves in the mirror and see how nice they look. But a lot of folks don't want to look at their heart. A lot of folks don't want to compare themselves. You know, they'll compare themselves to other people and say, well, I'm better than this one, and I want to be like this one, and I want to be... And they'll, and they'll compare themselves like that. But very few people, even folks that call themselves followers of Jesus Christ, want to look at themselves in the light of God's Word. They don't want to examine themselves. You start looking at yourself in the light of God's Word, man, you ain't going to like what you see. If you like what you see, then you should be a preacher. <laughs> Maybe you should be a pastor if you like what you see. But I'm telling you something. You could be, even the Apostle Paul said, I haven't got there yet. Even, even Paul who wrote the word, he, even he said, I have not yet attained. I'm still pressing on toward the mark. I'm still pushing on to be what Jesus wants me to be. He's, all these things are working together for good. To them that love God and are called according to His purpose. To conform us to the image of His Son. I hope Scott doesn't mind me saying this. But he gave a testimony about getting his job. I don't know if he's going to give me a dirty look or not. But he had to get fired from the one before. Okay? He had to get the pink slip. 
I'm sure when he got that pink slip, he said, oh, man, that's my job. But he ended up in the center of God's will. Okay, sometimes you've got to get the pink slip. We don't like getting the pink slip. But if we belong to him, if we're his, and we're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, there's nothing, if you're surrendered to him, I don't care what the company does, I don't care what the government does, I don't care what anybody does, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to be there, you'll be in the center of his will, and if you're just willing to let, to, to let him do what he needs to do, yeah, it's going to hurt for a little while. You know, if death hurts, when somebody that we love dies, that hurts. But Jesus said, unless a seed fall into the ground and die, it can't produce any fruit. Sometimes God got to let us die. They can bring something to life. Amen? Let a man examine himself. The Apostle Paul said. Let a man examine himself. To be sure to see if he be in the faith. Rosh Hashanah. Blowing a trumpet. Calling. Warning. 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 You know, it, it amazes me. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ramble on much longer. Because we want to take communion. Uh, it amazes me how many people are deaf to God's warning. People that go to church, people that maybe have their lives surrendered to Christ, may, they're deaf to God's warning. God's sending a warning. He's saying, look at yourself. He's saying, you're, you're dabbling in something you shouldn't be. And we, we have ways we can justify. We say, oh God, you know, mm -hmm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's ever been there. We try, to, we try to justify ourselves in front of God. Justify stuff we know we, that we're doing that we know is wrong, but we like it. So God would never deprive anything from us that we like, would he? Listen, people who are deaf, they can't hear. They can't see the signs. And not because, not because they're, they're, they're hidden. But what God told Isaiah, he said, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna hear, but they're not going to listen. They're going, to, they're going to see, but they're not going to perceive. You know, you could, you could see things. You could look at the stop sign, but if you don't stop, God is speaking to his people. He's speaking to his church. He's speaking to humanity. He's saying, you guys better get ready. You better get ready for the rapture. You better get ready. Who was it that said, prepare Amos? Pastor Todd preached from Amos the other night. Amos said, prepare to meet your God. We need to prepare. We prepared the Lord's table this morning. And somebody wants to go down and kind of rouse the kids up. And they're going to come up. We need to, we need to prepare. We need to be ready. We need, to, we need to look around us. We need to look at ourselves in the light of God's word. We need to see the things going on around us in the light of God's word. And we need to say, what's going on in my life? What's going on in my family? What's going on? We, need to, we need to learn how to discern things that are happening. We blind ourselves sometimes. I've been there. There have been, there have been times when God has tried to tell me things and show me things. And I just, it's just like the monkeys, you know, hear no evil, see no evil. And we do that sometimes, don't we? Huh? Hmm? Hmm? Nice. I'm too busy. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. God is saying, look, warning, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Let a man or a woman examine themselves to see if they be in the faith. To see if they are doing and saying and acting in ways that God wants them to act. See, it's easy to shrug all that stuff off and just say, no big deal. But eternity is at stake. If there's anybody in this room this morning that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you're welcome to come. We're going to pray. And again, we prepared the Lord's table. In just a minute, we'll be asking you to come and receive the elements and, and uh, take them back to your seat with you and hold them until everybody receives. Again, uh, we're, we have an open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. I have to know you. All, all that you need to be is born again and saved, and that's between you and God. You don't have to show me your membership card. This is between you and the Lord. So I want to pray. I want to take this time, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Father, we've heard your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the promises that you have given us in your word. We thank you, Lord, for the promises.
that we, that we see and we read. We thank you, Lord, that when we see things going on in our, in our world, in our nation, when we see these things going on, Lord, we don't have to be afraid because we know that you've ordained everything. We know, Father, that, that it's your time clock. It's your plan. It's your redemptive plan, Father. As we see uh, getting to a place where the armies might be getting ready to amass themselves around Jerusalem, it's not something we have to be afraid of. It's in your word. When we see the world economy crumbling because of foolish decisions and because of uh, ungodliness in that, in, that, in that sector, in that realm, Father, we don't have to be afraid because it's in your word. Father, when we see our, our culture, our, our society degrading to the point of, of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, when we see these things happening in our cities, Lord, we don't have to be afraid or dismayed. Jesus, you said, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Father, I pray that our ears would be open to your word, that our eyes would be open, ready to see and perceive. Father, that you would help us get our feet anchored on the ground of your word. And Lord, that we would stand in the name of Jesus. And that no matter what happens around us, no matter the things that come to pass, Father, that we would always keep our eyes focused, on what your word says. Father, we're in that time now. It's, it's an exciting time to be a believer. And it's a perilous time. Father, we thank you that your word tells us that there's nothing that can take us out of your hand. We thank you, Lord, that, that nor death, nor life, nor things in earth, nor things in heaven, nor things uh, out of the earth, under the earth, nothing, Father, can take us from the love of Jesus. We're standing on your word, Father. And no matter, sometimes we get afraid. Sometimes we get dismayed. Sometimes we get saddened by things that happen. Father, we lose loved ones. I just pray, Lord, that those loved ones that we have lost, that we know we will see them again, and that you will give us the peace of God that passes understanding. Father, as we examine ourselves this morning, Father, let us look at ourselves before we partake of your table. Children, won't you come? I'm going to ask the young men to come. He's going to lead you around. They're going to lead you around. But Father, as we partake of your table, I pray, Lord, you would allow us to look at ourselves. Father, to examine ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, and we give you glory in the name of Jesus. Come on, sis. Uh, we're going to ask you, young men, won't you come in? They're going to lead you around. We're going to ask everybody to receive the elements and hold them until everybody receives and we'll take communion together. Won't you come? Go ahead.